So as Ryan mentioned, our topic today is the incarnation of Christ. Uh, our belief that the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of the Father, humbled himself to take on our human nature in our human form. So that's what we're going to unpack today. I want to do that through a very specific lens, though. We could do that just by cracking open the catechism and reading all the passages on the incarnation uh, that's within the catechism that the church gives us as the formal doctrine, which would be a fine way to do it. But I want to take a slightly different tact. I want to use the principle lex orande, lex credendi. Now, that's a really fancy Latin term. I don't expect you to know what it means, so I'll tell you what it means. Uh, it translates as the law of prayer, lex orande, is the law of belief, lex credendi. And it's a principle within the church that tells us that our belief is rooted first and foremost in our prayer. That the doctrines that we have as a church come first through the relationship that we have with the Blessed Trinity. That it's that relationship that gives rise to how we understand what it is we believe. And if you think about it historically, it makes some sense. As we'll talk about a little bit later, it took a lot of centuries for the church to decide what we meant when we say things like, Jesus is fully God and fully human. It took centuries of the church and the bishops getting together in councils and meetings to wrestle what exactly we meant by that. But the church was already praying it. The church was already experiencing that relationship with God. We may not have known exactly what it meant doctrinally in terms of the specific formulas for how we were going to word that. But it was that experience of prayer that experience of coming to know God, to know Jesus, that then gives rise to what we say we believe in our formal creedal statements, in what the bishops have taught us as the formal language for how we understand those doctrines. So prayer comes first. Lex orande, lex credendi. Now, in more recent centuries, there's also been a third lex that's been added onto that. Lex orande, lex credendi, Lex vivendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief, which is the law of living. In other words, what we pray informs what we believe. What we believe informs how we should live our lives. If we really mean what we say when we say that Jesus is fully God and fully human, that should affect the way we choose to live our lives, the choices we make. If we really stand up on Sunday and say, I believe, when we recite the creed on Sunday. That better have an impact on who we are and the choices that we make, how we interact with people in our lives, how we treat our family members, our friends, our coworkers. You know, we should be different from everyone around us. People should be able to know that we are Christians just by the way we live our lives. Because how we pray informs what we believe, what we believe informs how we live. So what I want to do tonight, instead of starting with the catechism for learning what it is we mean by the incarnation is, I want to take a look at what are called the prefaces to the Eucharistic prayer. This is the Roman Missal. This is the book on Sunday that the priest uses to pray the Mass. It's got all the prayers that the priest uses. And the priest sometimes has choices about different prayers he can use. Sometimes they're a little more constrained on what those choices are. And during particular liturgical seasons, he has to choose specific prayers. So right now we're in Advent, so there's a whole series of prayers that are just used in Advent. When we come to Christmas, there's a whole set of prayers that are used just for Christmas, including a certain set of prefaces to the Eucharistic prayer. So the preface is that part of the prayer in the liturgy of the Eucharist, right after we do the, uh, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. You know, we do that dialogue, and then the prayer that the priest prays right after that is the preface to the Eucharistic prayer. It's like the introduction to the prayer. And it changes based on the liturgical season. And these preface prayers are richly theological. They are beautiful prayers. Unfortunately, because you know, we're all just standing up, we're getting ready, we often skip over them. I find myself often distracted at that point in the Mass, unfortunately. Really listen to those prefaces. Because they will often clue you in on what it is we really mean in this particular liturgical season. And during Christmas, these prefaces speak powerfully to what we believe about the incarnation. Now, there's three prefaces that the priests can choose to use during the Christmas season. Tonight, I want to take a look at all three of them and just unpack a little bit 
what it is they tell us about what we believe as Christians and Catholics about the incarnation of Christ. Okay? You on board with me? All right. So the first preface goes like this. For in the mystery of the word made flesh, a new light of your glory has shone upon the eyes of our mind, so that as we recognize in him God made visible, we may be caught up through him in love of things invisible. The first phrase I want to kind of clue in here is this phrase, God made visible. This is a radical thing within our tradition. Up until this point in history, God could not be fully visible to human beings. If you look back in the Old Testament, God is constantly being veiled whenever he appears to people. So when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God, the cloud descends on Mount Sinai and hides God's presence from the people and even from Moses. Moses cannot see God fully face to face. That glory of God has to be hidden by the cloud because the glory of God would destroy us otherwise. God is so great and so powerful and so awe-inspiring that we would just, you know, we would be destroyed in his presence. You know, because we're just lowly creatures. God is so other, so different from us. In fact, the last time that human beings were able to see God face to face was in the Garden of Eden. When we read the book of Genesis, we read that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. In the garden, Adam and Eve could see God because they did not have a sinful nature yet. They had not fallen yet. They had not chosen to sin against God. And so they could see God because they were in a state of innocence. We can't do that. We have original sin. We sin regularly in our lives. So we can't see God face to face. So to have God made visible is a radical thing. In Christ, God takes human form. God takes on a physical nature. So now he, we can again walk with God. The apostles, the disciples, those who knew Jesus during his time on earth, they walked with God just as Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. Because he humbled himself to take on our humanity. This is one of my favorite portraits of Antivity. I apologize, the lighting's not great. Uh, this is Gerard von Horthaut's Adoration of the Shepherds. And it's a beautiful depiction of the hiddenness of Jesus' divinity in his human nature. This is something you will often see, thank you, in pictures of the nativity, is the interplay of light and Jesus. Where is the light coming from in this painting? It's coming from Jesus. Jesus is the source of the light in the painting. You know, when you see paintings of the nativity, the painter will often depict Jesus this way, as the, the sole or the primary light source within the painting, as an indication that there's something different about this child. There's a power in him. There's a radiance to him that is a symbol of his divinity, that he is truly God. He is light from light. He is the true God from the true God. So these depictions of the nativity will often reflect the hiddenness of Jesus' divinity by showing light emanating from him. And not always even just the nativity. Sometimes there'll be other paintings of Jesus, even as an adult, where you'll see the light is being played with in a very interesting way to make that indication. So with the incarnation, we can now see God face to face. But how is this possible? He's still God. Why doesn't his glory overcome us? Because, as St. Paul tells us, he emptied himself, as we just heard in the reading with our opening prayer. The Greek word that's used there is the Greek word kenosis, which means an emptying, a giving over of. 
In 2 Corinthians, St. Paul says, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. And St. Paul isn't just talking about material poverty there, although Jesus, as near as we can tell, his family was not particularly well off. You know, he was born in a manger. Uh, you know, he, he was born into some material poverty. But the poverty St. Paul is talking there is that he emptied himself of some of the glory of his divinity so that he could take on our human nature without destroying it. Theologically, we talk about him emptying himself of his divine will and relying simply on his human will, but a human will that is perfectly aligned with the will of the Father. That doesn't mean he gave up his divinity. It doesn't mean that he somehow set it aside, put it under a blanket, walked away from it. It just means that he let his human nature not be destroyed by it. So what does that mean then? How can Jesus be both 100% God and 100% human? Again, this was a source of great debate in the early church. In fact, in some ways, it's the scandal of Christianity. No other religion talks about God becoming human. Other faiths have stories about their gods taking on a human form. Uh, think of the classical Greek stories. You know, Zeus will take on a human form and walk among his people, things like that. But that's always a kind of illusion. It's a kind of glamour that the gods take on. They're not changing their very nature. They're not really becoming human. They're just kind of creating an illusion of human form. We believe that God really took on our human nature, that he really became man. This is why the early church was so insistent on calling Mary the mother of God, or in the Greek term, theotokos, which the Eastern churches still use as a title for Mary. It's not because Mary gave birth to God before the beginning of time. That's not what we mean by mother of God. What we mean is that the person Mary gave birth to truly was God. And yet she gave birth to him as a human child. I want to show a little piece of a video. Uh, and this, there's no perfect metaphor or illustration we can, we can talk about. But this one I really kind of like. Because it's a good metaphor for what we mean when we talk about Jesus being both human and divine. Uh, this is a, an online series called Three Minute Theology. So it's just a short video, but it's going to talk a little bit about those two natures of Jesus. So it took a long time to reach this understanding of the hypostatic union. Uh, you know, this belief that both the human nature and the divine nature could exist together in the one person. Uh, it took centuries, really. And the church wrestled with this in order to figure it out. Uh, because there were people who taught differently. You know, they taught different things about Jesus. So on your handout, on the other side, I have a little chart here of some of these heresies from the early church that the early Christians were trying to figure out who Jesus was. Now, uh, we call these heresies false doctrines. One of the things I want to point out, though, is a heretic is not necessarily a bad person. They're wrong, <laughs> I don't want to deny that, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad people. They're, they're people trying to figure things out the best they can to figure out these mysteries of the divine life. And that's really what the incarnation is. It's a mystery. Now, when the church talks about a mystery, it doesn't mean something that's unknown that needs to be solved, like a murder mystery or a Scooby-Doo mystery or something like that. When the church talks about a mystery, it's talking about a truth that is so deep that we can never fully understand it. I like to use the image, we can never fully plumb its depths. It's like a bottomless well. We can never reach the bottom of a mystery. We can understand it, but not fully. So a mystery always invites us to deeper reflection, to deeper prayer, to consider more fully what this mystery means for us. And heretics are simply people who tried to plumb the depth of a mystery and made a mistake somewhere along the way. And oftentimes that mistake is they take one truth and elevate it too highly above all the other truths. So they wind up a little lopsided because they take one truth and say, this is the truth that un unlocks everything. This is the only truth we need. Forgetting that there's lots of other truths in our faith. So for instance, the heresy of adoptionism posited that Jesus was just a man who was adopted as the Son of God. In other words, he was born a human just like us, and it was only later in his life that God bestowed divinity upon him and adopted him as his son. 
We don't believe that. Arianism was probably the largest of these heresies. In fact, uh, it nearly was chosen as the official church's position. It was only through the work of really dedicated uh, bishops like Athanasius of Alexandria in particular, uh, and even St. Nicholas, uh, who fought against this heresy. Arianism taught that Jesus was not consubstantial with the Father, that he was not of the same substance or same essence as God the Father, but he was the first created thing that the Father created. Even before the Father created uh, the heavens and the earth and all that in the beginning of Genesis, he created Jesus. But that's also not what we believe. We believe that Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. Jesus has no beginning. He is begotten, but not created. And it was the councils that fought against Arianism that gave us the creed that we recite on Sunday. That's where that whole litany in the section on Jesus comes from. Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. All of that comes from the Council of Nicaea, which is the council that condemned Arianism as a heresy. So we don't believe that Jesus is just uh, the first created being of God. We believe the, that he is consubstantial. Docetism taught that Jesus was pure spirit, that his physical body was just an illusion. So kind of the opposite of adoptionism. You know, that Jesus really wasn't human at all. He was just spirit. He was just God. And his human nature was like that of Zeus. It was just an illusion. We don't believe that. We believe Jesus had a real physical body, a real human body. Monophysitism. You gotta love these names, right? <laughs> Taught that Jesus' divine nature overshadowed his human nature. You know, that it destroyed his human nature. We don't believe that. We believe that the two natures existed together. Nestorianism taught that Jesus is a divine person united with a human person. In other words, two different people. Two natures and two people brought together into one. Which is why they rejected that title of Theotokos for Mary. They believed that Mary was just the mother of the human part of Jesus. But we don't believe that either. And then one of my favorite names, Patripassianism taught that Jesus and the Father are not distinct persons, that Jesus and the Father are the same, exactly the same person, and that the Father also suffered on the cross. We don't believe that. We believe that it was Jesus, the Son, who, who suffered on the cross, but not the Father, because they're two distinct persons, even though they are consubstantial. So again, if this is confusing, if this doesn't make sense, that's okay, you're not alone. It's a mystery. This is one of the, the geniuses, I think, of Catholic thought, is that we often, when we are presented with two truths that we have to affirm, based on the tradition and the scriptures and all of that, when we come with two truths that seem to butt up against each other, instead of choosing one or the other, we say yes to both of them. Yes and. That Jesus can be 100% human, and Jesus can be 100% divine. And if that doesn't make sense, well, that's because we're human and we don't understand everything completely. And that's okay. But we know we have to affirm those two things. It's the same as when we talk about the Trinity. How can God be one and yet God be three persons? It's a mystery. We don't understand it. <laughs> but we don't have to understand it. We have to believe it. And we wrestle with these things over the course of a lifetime. You know, I've taken... Numerous theological classes. I have two degrees in theology. I don't understand this stuff 100%. I can explain it, but I still wrestle with these things myself. You know, and there's always more, more depth to be plumbed from them. One other side note before we take a look at the next preface. Because God is now visible, as we affirmed in that preface, this is one of the reasons why the Old Testament prohibition against making images of God no longer holds for us. Because God has taken on a form. God has taken on an image. If you could go back in time with a camera, you could take a picture of God in the form of Jesus. So because God has done that, that's why we believe we can now create icons and crucifixes and statues and, and other things. Because God has already given us a form in which he has taken. And so we can then depict that as well. All right. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, and I may, 
Maybe I need, I will need to be slapped down. But that, that's fine. There's a priest back there. You can have the question afterwards. <laughs> um, but I have re recently saw a video by a priest, and um, I think this actually ties in really well with it. And he was saying, and I've, you always hear stories about where did the devil come from? What did he rebel against? Mm -hmm. And he was saying, and I don't know if there's a theology, but his, his point was they rebelled against God being incarnate in Jesus. That blew their mind. We were the lowly humans, and that's what they rebelled against. I, I have heard that as one kind of theological explanation. And as, as you talk about this stuff, I can see how the, you know, it, it might work that way, but maybe it sounded interesting. Yeah, yeah we're, we're just, we're dirt stuff. We were dirt. We were dirt, literally. And yet, God has chosen to take on, if I can put it this way, God has chosen to take on that dirt in his own nature. It is, it's a radical idea. And yeah. the angels were way above us. So. Yeah. Yeah, and much closer to God. Yeah. Yeah, so you can understand why that might, might upset some of them. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. All right, so we've looked at the first preface briefly. I want to take a look at the second preface now. For on the feast of this awe-filled mystery, in other words, Christmas, that's the feast of the incarnation, for on the feast of this awe-filled mystery, though invisible in his own divine nature, he has appeared visibly in ours, and begotten before all ages, he has begun to exist in time, so that raising up in himself all that was cast down, he might restore unity to all creation and call straying humanity back to the heavenly kingdom. This may be my favorite of the three because it, it gives us such a, a vast view of what the incarnation means. So first, begotten before all ages, he has begun to exist in time. God exists outside of time and space. You cannot travel to anywhere in the universe and find God. He exists outside all of that. St. Thomas Aquinas says that God is not a being. He is the ground of all being. God is what supports all existence. And not just at the moment of creation at the beginning of Genesis, but right now, God is supporting all of existence. He is continuing to create all things by his will. If God stopped willing creation, we would all just blink out of existence. So even right now, God is continuing to create everything, ourselves included, and including time. God creates time because he is outside of all of time. And yet, as this preface tells us, he has begun to exist in time. Because even though he exists outside of it, our God is a God of history. What do I mean by that? In Luke's Gospel, when he starts to talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he sets it in a very specific time and place. I just want to quote this. This is the very beginning of chapter 3 of Luke's Gospel. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Euturia and Trochanius, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So this is the beginning of the John the Baptist story. But what Luke is doing there is he's telling us, in this specific time, in this specific place, our faith is not a faith of once upon a time, or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away but a, a story of faith here and now. In fact, historians can go back and they can say, by cross-referencing all the different reigns of all those different people that Luke is mentioning, you can narrow that down to a band of like two or three years that this would have taken place in. A very specific time, a very specific place. Our God is a God of history. He enters into our story. He enters into our time and our lives. We see this again and again in the Old Testament. God intervening for the Israelites. 
sending them Moses to call them out of slavery out of Egypt, walking with them through the desert, helping them to conquer and settle into the Holy Land, warning them that if they do not come back to the right worship of him, that they will be conquered by their enemies, which in fact happens. The Babylonians take them back to Babylon into exile and destroy the temple. And then God enters in to send them back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And then finally, in this particular time, in this particular place, sending his only begotten son in human form to be with us. Many other faiths have lots of stories of their gods, but they're stories that take place kind of in a vague mythological time. Again, think about the Greeks, or even the stories of the Hindu gods. They're mythological. They don't say it happened at a particular time and place. Our God operates in history. And in a particular way, through the incarnation, he becomes to exist in time. Not just to enter into it, but to enter and live in it with us for a period of 33 years or so. To walk with us in that history. Again, that's a radical thing. No other faith talks about their God this way. The other piece I want to talk about here is so that raising up in himself all that was cast down, he might restore unity to all creation. We often think about Jesus' redemptive work as being redemption for us as human beings. And that's true. Jesus came to redeem us in our sinful nature because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And through his redemptive work, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, what we call the Paschal Mystery, he has redeemed us. But he didn't just come to redeem us. He came to redeem all of creation. Because through the sin of Adam and Eve, all of creation was broken. All of creation was wounded. St. Paul in his letter to the Colossians says, God was pleased to have, his, to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Creation fell with humanity. In Genesis chapter 3, God tells Adam and Eve, Cursed is the ground because of you. The earth was cursed because of our sin. But through the incarnation, by taking on a physical form, Christ redeems all of created matter. Because God takes on a physical existence, all of physical existence has changed. Our human nature, yes, but all of physical nature itself is elevated because God chooses to come and exist in it. Christ redeems all of created matter. In the Old Testament, God sent various messengers and prophets to call the people back to him. In Jesus, God himself enters into the created order to lead his people back. Pope Benedict the 16th, in one of his encyclicals, says, When Jesus speaks in his parables of the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep, of the woman who looks for the lost coin, of the father who goes to meet and embrace his prodigal son, these are no mere words. They constitute an explanation of his very being and activity. His death on the cross is the culmination of that turning of God, in which he gives himself in order to raise man up and save him. This is love in its most radical form. This is one of Pope Benedict's constant refrains. The love that God has for us and the things he did to affect our salvation. The incarnation is an expression of God's love and mercy for humanity and all of creation. St. Paul's letter to the Romans says, For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Jesus is the one who restores humanity by taking on our human nature. He is the one who restores creation by saving all of creation. I love this painting because it shows that progression of the, of the story of creation itself. You know, the garden, full and lush and vibrant. And then our sin, which strips it all bare. And then the first shoot the tree of the cross, the tree on which our Savior hung. 
which then restores all things, not just to its original state, but to a superabundant state. The new created order we will enjoy when Jesus comes back is more than we can ever imagine. Earth itself will rejoice in that time. All right, so we've taken a look at the first and second prefaces that the priests have an option to use during the time of Christmas. Uh, now we'll look at the third and final one. This one goes, For through him the holy exchange that restores our life has shone forth today in splendor. When our fragility is assumed by your word, not only does human mortality receive unending honor, but by wondrous union we too are made eternal. I want to start with this idea of restoring our life. So we already talked a little bit about the fact that Jesus, by taking on our human nature, redeems the nature that was broken at the fall of Adam and Eve. St. John Paul II, in one of his encyclicals, said, Through the incarnation, God gave human life the dimension that he intended man to have from his first beginning. He has granted that dimension definitively in the way that is peculiar to him alone in keeping with his eternal love and mercy. So part of the point of the incarnation is to restore what was broken in the Garden of Eden, to give back to us what we lost, what we forfeit through our sin. It restores the life that we were meant to have in the love of God, to walk with God face to face in the Garden. But then this last phrase too, but by wondrous union we too are made eternal. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it this way. The word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. For this is why the word became man and the Son of God became the Son of Man, so that by entering into communion with the word and thus receiving divine sonship might become a son of God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. And that's quoting St. Athanasius, one of the early church fathers. He said, for God became man so that man might become God. Now what he meant by that was not that we're going to become God like God is God. God is the only God. We are not God. And we can never be God. What he meant is that by taking on our humanity, we are now able to share in the life of the Trinity. We can now come to know God intimately and share in the love that the Trinity shares. And the fancy we, word we use to talk about that is just grace. Because God took on our humanity, we now have access to the grace of God. The life that the Trinity shares in its own communion. God now shares that with us because it's been opened up for us through the incarnation. What it means to be human is forever changed. Because Jesus took on our human nature, to be human is no longer what it used to be. Our nature has been elevated. Pope St. Leo the Great said, Christian, remember your dignity. And now that you share in God's own nature, do not return by sin to your former base condition. Bear in mind who is your head and of whose body you are a member. Do not forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the light of God's kingdom. Christian, remember your dignity. Not the dignity of our fallen human nature, but of our restored human nature that Christ gives to us. That dignity is a gift. And so St. Leo is saying, don't return to sin. Turn your back on sin. Fight temptation. Don't wound the nature that God has given you. The glorious dignity that he has repaired in our human nature. Protect it. Fight against it. And when you fail, and you will fail, we have been given the great gift of the sacrament of reconciliation to repair that dignity again. We have access to that grace through reconciliation, through the Eucharist, through all the sacraments, through prayer, through the whole life of the church. We have access to that because God has opened the way for us by taking on our nature.
So if you want an image of what that realized human dignity is, of what that perfected human nature looks like in an actual person, you need look no further than the Blessed Virgin Mary. We have lots of dogmas about Mary and our beliefs about who Mary is and what her nature is like. But here's the key. We believe that what is currently true of Mary, that she is perfect in faith, perfect in obedience to God's will, that she gazes into the face of Jesus, her son, that she has been saved from the stain of sin. All those things we believe are currently true about Mary, we believe will be true of us when Jesus returns and establishes the kingdom of God. Mary is the image of what that perfected humanity looks like. That's why we honor her. It's why we ask for her intercession on our behalf. Because she shows us what our life is going to be like. Because God has granted that grace to her as the first of all humans to have that grace. She shows us what that life will be like. So we honor her. We come to know her because in knowing her, we know what her son wants for us. And she directs us to her son. A few just kind of closing reflections on the Incarnation. So I mentioned before, you know, kind of the, the Catholic view of things, that kind of both and, that's part of the Catholic genius. One of the other distinctive pieces of Catholicism, as compared to other types of Christianity and certainly other types of faith, is that the Incarnation is so central to our understanding, not just of Jesus, but of everything. The Incarnation is one of the central mysteries of our faith. It colors everything. It's one of the main lenses through which we see the world. We have an incarnational imagination. The way we see things is always through the lens of the Incarnation. We see God in the human. Even in our own fallen human nature, we can see aspects of the divine. The human is infused with the divine now. So we are baptized into that threefold mystery of Christ. We see it in our relationships, how we relate to one another. God himself is relationship. God is a trinity, which means that God is a community. So when we live in community, we are reflecting an aspect of the divine. Everything that we do can now have an aspect of grace to it because Jesus has done it all with us. So a good example is the work of our hands. You know, Jesus came to earth. He didn't just sit around doing nothing. You know, he worked. He did things. He did chores for his parents when he was a kid. We can surmise he probably worked in his father's workshop as he was growing older, was probably apprenticed to his father and learning how to be a carpenter or a, a builder whatever the work exactly was that, that St. Joseph was doing, he probably taught Jesus those things. I have a, one of my favorite paintings of the Holy Family. Oh, and I wish I could remember who the artist was. I should put it into my slides at some point. Uh, is a picture of the Holy Family in St. Joseph's workshop. And St. Joseph is back. He's kind of planing down a big piece of wood. Uh, he's got one of his helpers is helping him with that. Uh, John the Baptist is kind of standing to the side, kind of peering in, looking at things. And Jesus is a, a young child. He must be, I don't know, four, five, six, something like that. And he's got a splinter because he's been trying to help his dad work with the wood. And the Blessed Virgin Mary is kneeling down, you know, kind of, you can kind of tell like she just kissed the wound. You know, that's, it's such a beautiful picture of the Holy Family, but also an image of what our family life should be like. The family gathered together, doing things together, caring for one another. Our human relationships have been blessed because Jesus entered into human relationships himself. So in our family relationships, we can see aspects of God's relationship with us. All these things are infused like that. Even when we play, you know, if we play games with our kids, things like that, there's a divine element to that now. 
You know, it's been blessed by God's presence on earth. So we have this, sac- this incarnational imagination. It's fundamental to who we are as Catholics. Uh, so just by way of background, so how many folks are, are from a Protestant background uh, coming into the church? So if you, anyone from a fundamentalist background? Just, one here, okay. Uh, so fundamentalism is a way of reading the scriptures, which takes a very literalistic reading of the scriptures. You know that everything in it is history. There's no metaphor. You know we don't read into it myth or anything like that. Fundamentalism is everything is literally, literalistically true in the Bible. Catholics do not read the scriptures in a fundamentalist sense. We read it in a much more what we call a literal sense, but what we don't mean literalistic. When the Catholic Church talks about reading the Bible in a literal sense, what it means is we read it in the way the author intended it. So, for instance, there is poetry in the sacred scriptures, and we read that as poetry, not as history. There are certainly historical aspects to scripture. We read those as history, because that's how it was intended. There is myth in the scriptures, by which I don't mean something that's untrue, but by which I mean a story that is meant more to give a theological truth than a historical truth. So, for instance, the story of creation, we read in a mythological sense, not so much to say, does this tell us scientifically how the universe was created, but to ask, what are the truths that are trying to be communicated about who God is and what God has given to us? That's how Catholics read the scriptures. And one of the reasons we don't read scriptures from a fundamentalist point of view, from an overly literalistic point of view, is because of the incarnation. The incarnation, again, posits that the human and the divine can coexist together. That they need not be at odds. That they can exist together. Fundamentalism, at its root, is a rejection of the mingling of the human and the divine. As Catholics, we recognize that sacred scripture has as its authors, yes, the Holy Spirit, who inspired the human authors, but the human authors were also true authors because they wrote through their own particular historical and cultural lenses. They used their own language. Their personalities shine through. And St. Paul is a perfect example of that. When you read, especially some of the ends of St. Paul's letters, you get these wonderful little human bits of Paul's personality shining through. Paul dictated his letters. He didn't physically write the letters himself for the most part, except for a few places at the end, you can tell that Paul has now picked up the stylus, is what they would have used to write on the wax tablets. And he writes, look, this is me, Paul, writing with my own hand. And a few places he even says, look with what large letters I write. Paul had bad handwriting. He's pointing it out. This is me, Paul, writing myself, and look at how badly I write. I have to write with such big letters. There's even a couple of places, or at least one place, where the person who's transcribing writes his own little greeting to other people that Paul is writing to. I forget his name. He says, I, so-and-so, who am writing this letter, I send my greetings as well. You know, it's wonderful little human pieces shining through. You know, they don't have to be there. They don't give us any deep theological truths, but they help us to understand that the human authors left their own imprint on Scripture. Scripture is an example of the human and the divine existing together. So as Catholics, we understand the Scriptures will always have the human voice in addition to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So they are God's word. They are God's message to us, written in human language, written by people as well. Put another way, when the Holy Spirit inspired the holy authors, it didn't erase their own personality and will. We don't believe that scripture was transcribed. Muslims believe that. Muslims believe that the Archangel Gabriel came to Muhammad, and Muhammad was just a transcriber. He just wrote down what the angel told him to write down. That's not how we understand the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit inspired the human author wrote. So it's the human and the divine coming together. Fundamentalism, we would say, misunderstands that nature of the human and divine coming together. And so we reject fundamentalism as a way of reading the sacred scriptures. It's probably more time than I should have devoted to that, but I think it's an important point to make. (laughs) And then finally, so Christ was truly present. 
human and divine, when he walked the earth with us uh, during his time on earth. Christ continues to be present to us in other ways today, though. Christ still walks with us, not in physical form. His physical form was taken up into the kingdom at the ascension. But Christ continues to be present to us in a variety of different ways, most particularly through the liturgical life of the church. Christ is always present to us when the church comes together to celebrate the liturgy. And back in the 60s at the Second Vatican Council, when all the bishops of the church came to Rome to talk about how do we need to teach the Catholic faith right now, one of the things they pointed out when it came to the liturgy is there are four primary ways that Christ is present in the liturgy of the church. Four ways when we come together to pray together as a church that Christ is present with us. First, Christ is present in the person of the minister. So we'll take the Mass as an example because it's the one most of us are most familiar with. When we come to celebrate the Mass, Christ is present in the person of the priest who leads us, who presides over the prayer of the church. We say the priest is in persona Christe. He stands in the person of Christ before us. So when the priest is praying the Mass with us, it is really Christ praying through him. Christ is present when he leads us in the assembly. Second, Christ is present when the word is proclaimed. And there's an important distinction there. Because the church has insisted that it's present not just in the word, but in the word proclaimed. In the activity of the words coming out of someone's mouth to the assembly. Not just in the words sitting inert in a Bible. But in the word proclaimed, that's when Christ is truly present. They said that when the scriptures are proclaimed, it is Jesus himself who speaks to us, now and today. So that's why when it comes to the, the liturgy of the word, the priest doesn't say, all right, everyone sit down now, open up your Bibles, read silently to yourself, and raise your hand when you're done. We need the word proclaimed. There is something special about the breath passing through our throat and echoing the air molecules and going out into the church. You know, there's something special about that action that Christ then speaks to us today. So Christ is present in the minister, in the word proclaimed. Christ is present in the assembly, in those of us sitting in the pews. Christ is with us when we come together. Because Christ promised he would be. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. That's the promise he gave to us. Christ is present right now with us because we are gathered here in his name. Christ is truly present to us right now. And finally, he is present in the sacraments. In reconciliation, in baptism, in confirmation, in matrimony. In all of the sacraments, Christ is present, working to impart that sacramental grace to us, and most especially present in the Eucharist, where the bread and the wine truly become the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Then Jesus is truly present, not just with us spiritually, but physically as well, not in human form, but in the Eucharist itself, he is with us. This is the way the church loves best that Christ is still present with us. It's why we reserve the Eucharist so we can continue to dwell in his presence and be with him, even outside of the liturgical action. So the liturgy, the Eucharist, Christ is present there. Christ is also present in the poor and the marginalized and those on the outskirts of society, those who are outcast and unloved. Jesus said that he is with those people. The parable of the goats and the sheep in the end of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus says that when you give drink to the thirsty, when you feed the hungry, when you give shelter to those who have no home, you are doing those things to Jesus himself. And part of the point of that parable is, not just are you doing those things for Jesus, but in doing those things, your salvation depends on them. It's not optional. 
Christ has what we as Catholics call a preferential option for the poor. That God has a special love for the poor and the outcast. And we are called to go out to them. To leave the safety of our homes, to leave the safety of our parish boundaries, and to go and meet those people and serve them. This is why the church has established hospitals, crisis pregnancy centers, schools. People forget Catholic schools were initially there for the poor and for people who couldn't get a good education otherwise. Uh, I've actually done some work in Catholic health care. Catholic health care was established on the peripheries where people weren't coming and being, didn't have access to any kind of good health care. And so sisters would go to these communities and set up in their homes, in their convents, beds for the poor to come and be cared for because they deserve the same kind of care everyone else can get. Christ is present in the church. We say the church is the mystical body of Christ. Christ is our head. We are the different parts of the body. And so wherever the church is gathered, Christ is here too. This extends the incarnation through all of space and time because the church is here. The church is present. It's never gone anywhere. We've had rough patches, <laughs> but the church endures and is that enduring presence of Christ on earth. And finally, Christ is present through the lives of the saints. The saints give us an example of how to be a disciple, of how to be one who loves Jesus, so much that they dedicate their lives to knowing him and following him. And through the lives of the saints, we get glimpses into what the love of Jesus looks like. And one of the beautiful things about the saints is they give us innumerable ways in which we can visualize that love of Jesus because the saints are radiant in their diversity. No two saints are alike. The saints all come from different backgrounds and have different personalities, different charisms, different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so in the saints, we can see ourselves. That we don't have to change who we are in order to be a saint. We just have to strive for holiness. We just have to fight against temptation to give up our sinful ways and our bad habits. But that we can continue to be a, you know, an accountant, or a lawyer, or a parent. We don't have to give those things up to be saints. The saints give us lots of examples of how to live that life of holiness. You know, through various times and places and nationalities and ethnicities. You know, and one of the great things is the, that we're constantly adding new saints to the roster. You know, one of my favorites is, oh, I'm, I'm going to blank on his name because he's so new. The young guy from Italy. Uh, who loved video games. I mean, he's the, he was the first millennial saint. And he loved playing video games. No, but I, that's a great example I can share with my kids. You can enjoy video games, that's fine. But he didn't let it get in the way of his relationship with Jesus. He put it in its proper place. You know, he didn't just go and play video games all day. He gave himself a certain amount of time, and then he devoted himself to prayer and going to Mass and things like that. What a great example to young people. You know? And there's lots of saints like that. Uh, one, of the, one of the people I am most excited to hopefully in my lifetime get to be a saint, see to be a saint, is Dorothy Day, who started the Catholic Worker Movement in New York, who opened up houses of hospitality for the poor. And it was a wonderful example of serving Jesus and the poor, but one of the real reasons I'm excited to see her made a saint one day, hopefully, is that before her conversion, before she became a Christian, she had an abortion and regretted it for the rest of her life. And I think, what an example we can show to women who have had abortions and who are wounded by that. And to say, we have a saint who had an abortion. You know, even despite that, was able to find holiness and the love of God in her life and do amazing things. You know, we need lots of saints. We need to know lots of saints get to know them. I want to end on this, though. Saints aren't just those people that the church has recognized as saints, that have officially been canonized by the official process of the church. There's lots of unknown saints. That's why we celebrate the Feast of All Saints in November, as a recognition that the church doesn't know everyone who's in heaven. Not everyone has gone through that official uh, process to be recognized. 
And so there's probably saints in our life that we may know. You can probably think of someone that you know or a family member. You know, I think about my grandparents who live simple lives of faithfulness. I think especially of my, my grandfather, my dad's dad. Uh, my grandmother had a massive aneurysm when I was in about sixth grade. Uh, it's kind of a miracle she survived. But you know, it was a long, arduous process of recovery for her. And the faithfulness my grandfather showed to her, the love and care to help her through that whole process, to stand by her side once she was able to move back home, you know, changing the whole house to make sure that she could navigate it in her wheelchair and things like that, and yet didn't let it impede their life. Still got out and did things, you know, went to ball games and things like that. You know, this has been a real example for me in my life of the kind of devotion I should have to my own wife. You know, but that to me, that's the kind of holiness that we see in the people all around us, in those unrecognized saints. Jesus is present in them as well. And a lot of them are hidden, but they're all around us. So to kind of sum up then, the doctrine of the incarnation is that God has become man in order to heal the rift between humanity and divinity, to heal the wounds of all creation, and to make visible the glory of God. And the glory of God is most visible on the cross, in the human physical suffering of Christ, on which we see not a broken body, but the glory of God, who has given all of his love and mercy for us, for our salvation.